We're going to talk about a truth that is actually proven through uh, studies and through um, certain forms of psychoanalysis. And one of those things that I want to talk about is the Brandolini principle. And uh, I don't know how you have heard this. I, I'm sure you've heard it. Um, it's attributed to everyone from uh, Winston Churchill all the way to Hillary Clinton. But albeit, here's the thing that you have probably heard. Truth makes it, or lies make it halfway around the world before truth can get its pants on and get started in the morning. And so basically that concept is boiled down into the idea that it is very hard to keep up with rumors. And rumors are a complex thing because rarely does someone put out a bold face, bald faced, however you want to say it, lie. Most of the time it's it's inculcated in a rumor mill that is, I heard this from someone. Now, on this podcast, I've talked about this before. I've talked about um, a book called Conversations About Truth, where journalism, you know, journalists talk to somebody and they say, you know, there was shots fired in the cafe. And they turn around and breathlessly say, ah, uh, shots were fired in the cafe. It was reported to us. And yes, that is true, but that's not the truth. Okay, so let's talk about it a little bit more. There was a Italian software engineer named Alberto Brandolini. In 2014, he came up with a principle. Um, the amount of energy needed to refute rumors or baloney is an order of magnitude bigger than what was needed to produce it. In other words, producing malarkey or baloney or whatever you want to call it, producing it is a lot less work than cleaning it up. Um, it's a lot simpler to produce the rumor. It's a lot cheaper. It, it doesn't take any extraordinary feat, but you could literally spend the rest of your life chasing down rumors to try to ascertain what is the truth, who said it, where did it come from, okay? So in, in his understanding of it, uh, an Italian blogger is writing about the Brandolini principle, which is that it takes less energy to create chaos than it does to manage and clean it up. And one blogger said, an idiot can create more baloney than you could ever hope to refute. And conspiracy theorists, radio personalities, such as Alex Jones and the recent Sandy Hook deal where he denies all of that, um, it, it is almost infinitely impossible to nail down a rumor or to nail down a conspiracy theory and to hold it accountable, okay? So let's, let's talk about something that's interesting, um, the Wakefield study, okay? Uh, it was done, it was an exceedingly and shockingly poor study that was done in 1998 uh, in The Lancet by British physician Andrew Wakefield and colleagues. In this article and in numerous subsequent press conferences, he alludes to the fact that the, the you know, measles vaccine creates and causes um, all kinds of things. Now, it has been proven that uh, Wakefield was found guilty, actually, of serious professional misconduct by Britain's General Medical Council. He was admonished for his transgressions around the 1998 paper, 
for subjecting his patients to unnecessary and invasive medical procedures, including colonoscopies, lumbar, lumbar puncture, and for failure to disclose financial conflicts of interest around his paper. But here is what is interesting. While this paper was shockingly incomplete, the abounding and and the multiplicity of conspiracy theories that burst out of that was almost unmanageable, okay, to the point that there was bankruptcies involved and all kinds of other things, okay? So rumors are not only easy to create, they're unbelievably easy to spread. And where did the, the saying actually come from? It came from a man in 1710 named Jonathan Swift, who wrote that falsehood flies and truth comes limping after it. So the Brandolini principle boils down uh, with Jonathan Swift's observation tells us that rumors take far less work to create than to clean up, takes less intelligence to create than to clean up, and spread faster than efforts to clean it up. So the danger is that rumors become um, intoxicating because it fuels the suspicions of the mind and, and there's no peer review on the rumor mill. It's something that is just absolutely um, kind of crazy and, and everybody can jump on board. And so what, what happens is, is we're living in a world where the primary, and this is shocking to me, especially as a reader and, and an avid reader, voracious reader and a disciplined reader, that people get their news from social media sites. Now, we, we've seen this with the, the last president of the United States where his primary source of in routing the traditional media, and I might add, with cause. I get it. The media is not to be trusted. I understand that. Albeit, here's the thing. I am a subscriber and have been a longtime subscriber of the Wall Street Journal. Every day, Monday through Friday, I don't really read the weekend edition ever, um, unless there's something in the you know entertainment part or they're talking about some kind of new thing that they're doing in technology or whatever. I'll read a little bit on the weekend. But as a avid reader of the Wall Street Journal. I read every day, five days a week, and every day there is a correction and retractions part. And you read that and you find it interesting, the ethical um, mandate to go back and say, whoops, we printed this and this isn't necessarily uh, the truth. We heard this from X place and it wasn't true. What is interesting to me is nowhere on social media is the corrections and retractions page. I, I, you can't follow the corrections and retractions that go on in Facebook and Twitter and, uh, Instagram and YouTube. It's just, it's ad nauseum. And so what's interesting is many of the messages sent on these platforms are rumors being passed from one person to the next. And rumors are, are kind of interesting in and of themselves, but both can be products of intentional deception. And uh, retracing the path of a rumor's spread is largely looking at a matter of where it come from. So here's the deal. You can't hardly chase a rumor down. One of the interesting things though in our society is that you actually can through uh, metadata on these social media sites. So for instance, the uh, conspiracy revolving the Sandy Hook massacre, this is how they do this. They track it down. Where was it first mentioned? Where was the first? And, and it was such a naive, muted, soft entry of, of, you know, speculative thinking or, or loose connection of ideology. And then the next post, it grows with affirmation and then it grows with confirmation and then it grows with validation to the degree that it becomes something that is inculcated in the culture. So now, no matter what you do to the man who started 
the Sandy Hook rumors that it was a government conspiracy that set it all up for these kids to be massacred so that they could en route it to gun control. You go back and you find it and, it, and on social media, it can be proven. And that's why the lawsuit was so outstanding and stunning is because they could prove who said what and where it was started. Okay. The problem is, is that it will never go away. And so if you were to Google this today, there is still an insurmountable amount of false information there about this that is stunning in its scope. And so in the Brandolini principle, you have to think about this. Is it easy to start a rumor? Absolutely. Does it take a great deal of effort? No, it's cheap. And is it hard to clean up? Yes. So almost any time a rumor is released, it becomes a truth by virtue of it not being able to be cleaned up. And so this is something that every communicator, every person has to think about. Uh, several years ago, I was at a conference. The conference was No Limits. And there was a, a, a elderly gentleman uh, that was one of our elder statesmen in our movement. He was preaching a message. He made comment about something he had heard and someone had linked someone to Pentecost or apostolic doctrine. He made the comment in his sermon. It was actually a almost a, a side note. It wasn't of any, um, you know, core value to the, um, to the main thrust of the message. And then afterwards, someone confronted uh, him in, in a kind and godly way and just said, hey, I don't I actually think she was connected to Pentecost. And what he did was interesting to me. He got on social media. He made the statement again that he had made during the, the conference sermon, retracted it, and set the record straight and and, and I looked at that and I thought, now, there is a man of high integrity because it takes, and, and it was at that moment that I thought to myself, I trust that man. And he, he could be a voice in my life because even though he didn't owe anybody that, because technically he could have just said, you know, here's what it is. And, and somebody did tell me that. So I wasn't wrong in what I said, that I was told that she was connected to Pentecost, but he didn't do that. He took the high road on, on that or the low road rather, and humbled himself and corrected it. And I thought that man in no way besmirched or tarnished his reputation. What he did was he actually um, created more value in his ethical approach. And so one of the things that, that's extremely interesting to me is that as we move through a culture, you, you find that we are all speaking, we are all talking, we are, our body language speaks, everything about us is communication. Now, in the end, here's what is differentiated between the human body or the human experience as opposed to the animal kingdom is the animal kingdom is as communicative as we are. I, I train horses and it is unbelievable how well they read body language and how they communicate to me. And so a lot of people call it horse whispering and all that jazz. It's not. It's communicating through the way that they communicate. Now, when an animal communicates, okay, they, they are sending self-regarding signals. Self-regarding signals refer to the signaler itself rather than to something in the external world. For example, it, it, they'll signal, I'm hungry, I'm angry. I'm attractive. I, I would be a good mate. I would be a good producing partner of offspring. Um, I'm poisonous. I'm dangerous. Uh, I'm a member of this group. Are all self-regarding signals because they convey something about the signaler. Okay. 
Other regarding signals refer to elements of the world beyond the signaler itself. Such signals are uncommon, virtually unfound among the animal signals, and with notable exception of an alarm clock. So most non-human animals simply don't have ways to refer to external objects. Humans are different. One of the novel or nearly novel futures of human language is that human language gives us the vocabulary and grammar to talk about not only ourselves, but also other people and other external objects in the world. So this is important because there are times when there is deception in self-regarding and you're, you're emitting the body language that says I'm poisonous if you're an animal and you may or may not be. Okay. Um, one, of, one of the, the, one of probably the easiest, uh, ways to talk about this is the mantis shrimp. There is probably, um, in, in my opinion, there's not a badder animal in the ocean, you know, ounce for ounce weight than the mantis shrimp. So, it has these claws on the beginning uh, at the at the front of it and at the beginning it just barely moves but these claws flash out at 50 miles per hour and they are so unbelievably strong that they can crack a snail's shell instantly and and like if you ever see them strike under the water it creates like these these bubbles okay that it, it, an underwater phenomenon and it's known as cavitation bubbles. It's literally like if you've ever seen in the comics that somebody hits you and it's a kapow, that it literally happens underwater. When that mantis shrimp hits out, it kind of offers this explosiveness. And, and so I've seen them a lot. I've actually never been struck by one or have I ever seen one strike, but I've seen documentaries and, and video where they do it and there is a there is kind of a an explosion imagine that it is the underwater version of breaking the sound barrier so when a plane breaks the sound barrier it goes fast enough and there's a um there, there's a bit of a, a sound to it well the same thing kind of on the same principle is in the mantis shrimp but there's one time where the mantis shrimp is completely vulnerable and that is because they are crustacean and they have a shell they have to molt every so often i actually don't know how often it is they come out they molt out of their shell and they retract back into their hole now at that time their claws or their punching arms are completely limp they 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 couldn't it's like jello they they can't punch they can't do anything so what they do is, is while they're vulnerable, they begin to strike out constantly. And so anything that knows this is a danger and they know they really can't ascertain and tell whether or not that mantis has its, has its shell or not. So the mantis begins to basically deceive by striking out, okay? And what it's doing is it's, it's striking at others Okay, to send the signal about themselves saying, I am dangerous and I'm in a mood to strike. Okay, what it is though is actually a deceptive measure because they couldn't strike if they wanted to. Uh, there's no power behind it. And so all they're doing is moving these muscles without shell. And so what they figured out is that these mantis uh, shrimp will enforce begin to move as if they're all going to attack. Well, then it creates this kind of chaos on the reef. So this is a self-regarding form of communication. And, you, you know, I've thought about this in relationship to rumors quite often. And um, the ones that strike out the most at others quite possibly are indicating, instead of indicating that they're dangerous or that they're strong, they may be indicating a weakness. They may be indicating insecurity. It's like Malia tells me all the time, Douglas, the ones that need your love the most are the hardest to love. And so what you realize in these things is that there are times when rumor becomes 
something that is a self-defense mechanism for people that are hurt, for people that have huge voids and, and lack in their own life. And, and because they're vulnerable, they, they, they begin to flash out and attack at others. And so what this does is it creates this form of chaos in the, in the ecosystem around or the biosphere around them. And so what we have to realize is that we are communicators. Our God, our Father, okay, which is in heaven, is a speaking God. He did everything. He didn't even create the world without using his voice, okay? The world was made by the voice of God. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God said, so we are the offspring of a speaking God. And because we are the offspring of a speaking God and bear his image, we too create worlds by the words and the language we use. Now, probably one of the most interesting subjects to me on planet Earth is language, how it's used, how it's abused, and how it's misused, how it's applied to benefit good or evil. And who would have ever dreamed if, if somebody would have asked me in the 90s when I was a teenager and a young man just starting out on my ministry, do you think there will be a resurgence of long-form conversation? I would have laughed at them. I would have said, no, the world's getting everything in sound bite sizes. But what happened is, is because nature teaches us that we are a speaking people, and that is our prime way of disseminating information and communicating, long-form communication has come back, i.e., uh, Ben Shapiro, Joe Rogan podcasts, um, uh, um, Glenn Beck, uh, who's some Jordan Peterson. I mean, it goes on and on and on. A uh, valuetainment guy. I mean, it just goes on and on and on about these guys. And it has taken on a resurgence, which means that the world is hungry and open for ideation. And they're open for a vocalization of of the ideals that have been dismissively derided in the last um, century. So um, w when you think about it, you think about the intelligence that's in the human mind, and you think about even how intelligent the animal kingdom is, such as the orcas, as you watch them and you hear them as they click and whine and, and emit these signaling um, communications that are actually elaborate communicative skills that are orchestrating hunting methods and all kinds of things. And so what, what you realize is that communication is priceless, and that's why we need to guard it. That's why Jesus taught us, let your yeses be yeses and your noes be no. Uh, don't don't do the law you speak. Don't use weasel words. Don't don't um, work it around to where nobody knows what you mean. Be an effective communicator. Be as kind. Be as gentle. Be as meek as you possibly can. But don't say yes when you mean no, and don't say no when you mean yes. Let your yeses. All your communication should be defined by your intent. And if it is your intent to do something, then say as much. Even if somebody doesn't want you to be that or doesn't want you to do that, say as much. Same thing is if your intent is no, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to lead someone along. I'm not going to have um, weasel words and lawyer speak to where people don't know, is he real? Is he transparent? Is he authentic? These are all things that we should understand in our world that as the Christ-bearing image, we should have communication skills that are transmitting good news, the gospel, not transmitting our own self-regarding uh, uh, vulnerabilities, nor should we be transmitting rumors of defensive positions, but we should be transmitting good news, the gospel. 
And that is one of the most important things that the apostolic church can be engaged in is the propagation of the gospel, of the good news. And I said this a, a week or so ago when I was preaching. I, I, you know, a lot of people, I talk to a lot of people in town and, and it always leads to politics. It always leads to that, that thing that we're wrestling with in our society. And a lot of times Christians, uh, Pentecostals can say, you know, th- th- someone says, well, what, what do you think about this? Or what do you think about uh, Trudeau or, or Biden or Trump or whoever it would be, right? DeSantis or whatever. And, and you have to understand that they are coming to you to ask you a question. But why? Why are they doing that? Number one, it is my firm conviction that God has led them to you so that while they are trying to gauge what you know, you are introducing them to who you know. So when someone comes to me and starts into the politics, I'm like, yes, here is an open door that I can probably start with, you know, the, the eschatology and, and the way that the world is going and how the church is the counterculture and the revolution stage of what it is to stand against a world that is trying to amass righteousness and justice uh, through other means than Jesus Christ. So when they come to me, I, I need to explain to them who I know, not just prove to them what I know. And I made this statement. I said, if people are coming to you and opening up and you are only spending your time telling them what you know, you are in sin. You are abdicating your responsibility because God sent them to you so that you could introduce them to who you know, not what you know. Okay. So, uh, so what is, I'm going to use two examples here. The, the mantis shrimp is is transmitting communication self-regarding communication about its own vulnerabilities okay now probably one of the most brilliant animals uh in the animal kingdom is what is known as corvids and this is ravens crows and jays okay they are remarkably intelligent birds They manufacture the most sophisticated tools of any non-human species. They manipulate objects in their environment to solve all manners of puzzles, okay? And you've probably heard the story of Aesop's fables about the crow putting pebbles into the into the jar and and the water, you know, coming up. It's probably based on a real observation at some point. Captive crows can figure out how to do this sort of thing, and ravens plan ahead for the future, selecting objects that may be useful them to, useful to them later. Crows recognize human faces and hold grudges against those who have threatened or mistreated them, and they use their most advanced techniques of communication to to sow or pass these grudges along to their fellow crows and their offspring. Now, we don't know why they're actually so smart, but it is interesting. There was a study done at a college, and the college um, had a man who was trying to exterminate him, and he wore a certain mask. And, And so it got established that this man with this mask is a threat. And so way later at a different university campus, a man with the same mask walked onto that campus and the Ravens went absolutely berserk, okay? They knew who he was and they knew the danger because they had communicated within their fellow crows uh, to pass on the grudge they had with them. So in the animal kingdom, self-regarding information and other regarding information. So self-regarding information is the animal kingdom telling you how vulnerable they are. And other regarding information is the animal kingdom telling you what a threat someone is or telling about it. So when we think of human behavior, the Bible says that it is the, it is the honor of a king to reveal a matter but it is the glory of God to cover the matter. 
So when God gets glory, he puts something to silence. Man wants everybody to know that they're in the know. And if you've ever been around powerful people, the most powerful man or person in the room is probably not over there flexing like I'm in the know, I'm in the know. He's almost setting back, excuse me. He's almost setting back saying, I don't need to prove to everybody that I'm in the know. I am in the know. I'm going to be quiet and watch what these people say and see what I can learn. But if you've ever been around somebody who really isn't powerful and they really aren't in the know, they're urgent to get in. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I heard something about that. Well, what'd you hear? Uh, and, and you can just watch their body language. They actually don't know anything about what they're talking about, but they want people to think that they're in the know. Okay, so this is a challenge with rumors and rumors are where we try to get others to fall into a certain state of chaos because we're vulnerable and communication that passes on threats or passes on information about threats. Okay, and so what I'm saying is that it is extremely important that we as truth seekers and speakers, that we guard our words and don't fall prey to the rumor mill. So it's easy to just stand up here, you know, and preach and say, um, you know, we should not be given to spreading rumors. But there's actually deep psychological damage that gets done by people who are constantly putting out rumors. And the Brandolini principle lives in our personal world. It is easier to start chaos than it is to clean it up. And if it takes, let's say, I'm just going to use numbers. If it takes four units of energy to create a rumor, it will take 40 units of energy to try to track it down, clean it up, put the fire out. Okay. It is so important that all of our communicative skills all of our efforts in communication be used to transmit the light of the gospel out of us, okay, and to, dis and to just spread the gospel, the good news. And the good news is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and how he died for our sins, was buried in the ground, three days and rose again. First Corinthians 15, one through four, Paul said, this is the gospel. Okay. Now how that gospel is applied to me, the Bible says, as many as have been baptized, have been baptized into Christ Jesus. Romans six teaches me that as he died in the natural, I die through repentance. I die out to my sinful nature my sinful spirit, my self-interested ways, my self-regarding communication, okay? I die out to all of that, okay? I'm buried with him in baptism for the remission of sins, okay? For the remission of sins, not an outward profession of an inward confession. It's a reason we're doing that, not just to show everybody on the outside what we believe on the inside. There's something actually spiritually and eternally legal that happens when one is baptized. One is buried, and when they are buried, their past is buried with them. And then they are raised again in the newness of the resurrection and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. And that is the gospel. And Acts 2.38 is the plan of salvation. That's what I ought to be using. All that I know, all that I read, all the arts of communicative ability and skills that I have, I need to harness them and I need to align them to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And while others are communicating their inward vulnerabilities and others are gossiping about a rumor that happens somewhere else, we need to transmit and gossip the good news of Jesus Christ. Go out and spread the news. Go out and let the light that is in you shine. Don't hide it in a bushel. Don't hide it under the table. Put it on the table that it may give light to all the house. That's what an apostolic Pentecostal 
should be using their skills in communication for you.